Welcome to Revelation, the book. These lessons are dedicated to the Lamb who was slain, who has redeemed us to God. Hebrews 9 and verse 28 announces, Just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face the judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. In Revelation 16 and verse 14, that wonderful day of Christ's second coming is called the great day of God Almighty. And that's a perfect description of the day. Because indeed it's a great day. If you are one of those whom Christ has been able to forgive sin through the death that he died on the cross because of your repentance from sin and your faith in him and because you've been baptized into him, buried with him in baptism so that your sins might be washed away in his blood. If that's your standing with Christ, our God Almighty, then when that wonderful day comes, it will be a great day for you. And that, in fact, is an understatement. It will be the greatest day of any day. There could be no greater day than this. But not only is it the great day, it's the great day of God. And it's certainly God's day. Because on that day, God is going to show once and for all that he is supreme. Satan poses as God's alternative. Satan indeed is God's enemy, but Satan is not almighty like Jesus Christ. Satan is not able to overcome Christ. Christ will overcome Satan. And that great day of God almighty or as it's called in another place in Revelation, the day of God's wrath, that day will prove that God is the one who reigns supreme and righteousness and goodness prevails over sin and evil. This great day which is coming, that is second only to that great day and that is the day when Jesus died upon the cross so we have two great days in the history of humankind the day of Christ's death when he made the sacrifice to bear the sins of many and then that day which is in the future when he will come not to repeat what he did the first time but to bring the salvation to us that he made possible the first time. I like to think of it this way. In that day that is past, long past, Jesus took away my sins. Or at least he made it possible for my sins to be taken away. In that great day when Jesus comes again, he won't take away my sins because he's already done that. He will come not to bear sin. He will take me away. Take me away out of this world and away from Satan and away from all evil influences and he will take me into the presence of God and into eternity, into his own dwelling place. And that is the most marvellous thing. Nothing else is more important to me than those two great days, the day in which Christ died and the day of his coming. Now I know... I know that one of those days is past and another one is future. And you might say, how can you make these things relevant in your present life? Since one is history, it's past, and another is future, it's just hope. What about now? Well, you see, these things are not as far away as they seem. As we've said in our previous lessons, you can divide the period between Christ's first coming and his second coming into three short periods, very short. One of them is that period between his first coming and his death upon the cross and your coming into this world. Now that 
period because you haven't actually lived in it or experienced it, that to you is just like a day or two. You can see that period just as God sees uh, human history. One day is with the Lord like a thousand years, according to Second Peter 3. And that's how you can view that, because you didn't have to sit through all that period looking at your watch, waiting for it to go by. You can look down those 2,000 years of history, or approximately 2,000 years, you can look down that period as if it were just a couple of days. And so, really, the cross of Jesus Christ is right there beside you, within easy reach. You can reach out to the cross. You can have the forgiveness of sins right now that that cross, although it, in terms of temporal history, it's a long way back, in real terms, in the kind of terms that matter, in God's terms, that cross is right there. And all you have to do is just reach back a little way to find it and find the salvation that is there. And in the same way, the great throne of Christ, which you will see on Judgment Day, that great throne, it's, it's not in the far distant future. Although in temporal history, it might well be another 2,000 years away. Nobody knows. But in, in real terms, in the way God sees and understands time, that period is so short. Because the only event that can possibly matter that separates you from that second coming day, that day of God Almighty, is your death. And you don't know when your death is going to be. It might be today. It might be next year. It might not be for several decades. But however long it is, it's a very short while. As we saw in our previous lesson, James says, What is your life? It's just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And after it has vanished away, after you die, the period between your death and Christ's second coming will not be measured in temporal terms. It won't be measured by the hours and the days and the weeks and the months and the years that we experience in this world because you'll be out of this world and you'll know nothing that goes on under the sun, nor will you be ruled by the time that the sun controls. And so that time between your death and Christ's second coming, that could be just like a moment in the twinkling of an eye from your death till when you stand before his throne. So that throne like the cross. It's nearby. You can just almost reach out and touch the judgment throne of Christ. That's how close it is and how relevant it is to your life right now. So you have these two great days, the day of the cross, the day of the throne, the first coming of Christ when he died to take away your sins, and the second coming of Christ when he comes to bring you the salvation that he made possible. Unfortunately, some people will not conceive of their life as a short period squashed between two great days. The day of the cross and the day of the throne. In Revelation chapter 6 and starting at verse 12, we have a picture of those sort of people and how they will react when the day of the throne comes. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as the late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in the caves. And among the rocks of the mountains, they called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Well, you can stand on that day. If you uh, will give your allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you will maintain your faith in Him until death, 
you can stand. You will not need to call to the rocks and the mountains, fall on me. You will have lived your life by the principle that the angel proclaimed to all the peoples of the world in Revelation 14, verse 7. Fear God and give him the glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Now let us give our attention to some of the uh, vision symbols that are connected with this day, the great day of God Almighty. The first of those is what's usually called the Battle of Armageddon. Actually, in the book of Revelation, there are a couple of battles. You recall that there was a vision in which there was a battle between the dragon and Michael the archangel. And uh, the dragon was cast down to the earth and was conquered. As we get nearer to the end of the book of Revelation, we read about a battle that the kings of the earth and their armies engaged in against Jesus Christ, the rider on the white horse, and his armies who all rode on white horses. There's a verse in Revelation 17, it's verse 14, it sums it all up. It says, They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them, because he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And with him will be his called and chosen and faithful followers. Now some people think that these battles are historical battles. One that happened a long time ago, back in antiquity, when Michael fought Satan. And another which is yet to happen sometime in the future. But I don't believe that these battles in the book of Revelation represent historical battles in the sense that one has happened a long time ago and one is going to happen sometime in the near future. I believe that these are representations or symbols of a real battle going on in our lives right now. And that battle is referred to in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 12 to 13 and we've already read this passage too in our in this lesson series. But in Ephesians and chapter 6, Paul speaks to us about the spiritual battle that is going on between righteousness and evil, between us as the servants of Christ against Satan who would seek to destroy us. Ephesians 6, 12 to 13. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now that's going on right now, he says. Our struggle is against these things. That's the battle of Armageddon. That's the battle between Michael and the dragon. They're not historical battles in the past or in the future. They're representations of a real battle, a spiritual battle going on in your life now. And he goes on in verse 13 to say, Therefore, this is what you should do about this, put on the full armour of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. So you are involved now in a battle, in the battle of Armageddon, if you wish, and that battle you must win. And how can you win it? You can win it by being on the Lord's side and by putting on the armour that he provides. That armour goes on to be described there in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm sure you're familiar with that. But put on the faith and the gospel and the truth and fight that battle well. Because very soon, that battle will be over and you will be singing the victory song. Another Judgment Day symbol is that of the second death. Reading some verses from chapter 20 and 21 of Revelation, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night for ever and ever. 
And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulphur. This is the second death. I want you to imagine how horrible that second death will be because it basically is a separation utterly and eternally from the presence of God. Now we can't see God, at least not directly now, but we know we are in His presence. I've been in God's presence all of my life and I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be banished from God's presence even for a moment, let alone for all eternity. Can you imagine the dreadful and bitter irony of being raised from the dead and seeing Hades, the world of the dead that held you in its grip, thrown into the lake of fire and you were free, only to be told that having been raised from the dead, you must now enter into the second death. The answer to the second death is the first resurrection. If you partake in the first resurrection, the second death can have no power over you. In Revelation 20, we've already read this in previous lessons, it says, This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who have a part in the first resurrection, the second death has no power over them. So obviously, if we want to escape the second death, we have to participate in the first resurrection. Well, what is that? Well, you recall that in the vision, the souls of those who had been slain for the testimony of Jesus were brought back to life. And... When we studied that, we said that you did not have to be actually a martyr, but you had to be a martyr at heart. That is to say, you have to have a commitment to Jesus Christ that rules your life to such an extent that you would be willing to give up your life and die, if need be, for the testimony of Jesus, for your faith. That's how much your faith means to you. You would even die for it if called upon to do so. A martyr at heart. Now, people who enter into that kind of commitment are totally changed. They are, as the Bible says, born again. Or as this says, raised. It's a resurrection. It's a new life. It's a total transformation. Now, when does this change occur? Well, it shouldn't occur toward the end of your Christian life, should it? Or in the middle, it should occur at the very beginning of your Christian life. When you enter into Jesus Christ, you should carry that commitment with you and hold it in your heart all through your life in Jesus. And so, when we have faith in Christ and when we repent of our sins, and when we obey his gospel, provided we do so with that kind of faith and with that kind of commitment that says, I will die for the Lord Jesus if I have to, then we enter into his death and his blood cleanses us from all sin. And the person that we used to be is crucified and buried, and we are raised up to walk in newness of life. We read about that over in Romans chapter 6. Uh, I'll read this again because it's so important. We've already touched upon it in our previous lessons. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him 
through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And it goes on to talk about how our old self was crucified with him. Crucified, buried with him, raised with him. That's the first resurrection. When you are born again, when you have new life in Jesus Christ. If you have new life in Jesus, if you have been born again, if your old self has been crucified with him and his blood has washed your sins away, then you have nothing to fear from the second death, pictured in Revelation as that awful fiery lake of burning sulfur. Now we come to another symbol, and that is the symbol already mentioned at the outset of this lesson, the symbol of the throne and of the books. In Revelation 20, verse 12, we read, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now let's think first about the throne. In the Bible, the throne of Jesus Christ is David's throne that he inherited. And you remember early in Revelation, in the messages to the seven churches, Jesus is described as the one who holds the keys of David. And it says there that what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. That is to say, his judgment is absolute and it's final. And against his judgment, there is no appeal. So whatever is said on the day you stand before the throne, that is said for all eternity, and you cannot change it. And he said how when he sits on his throne in glory, he will divide all the peoples of the earth as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he'll put the goats on his left and the sheep on his right. And of course he will say to those on his left, you must go away into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But to those on his right, his sheep, he will say, Come, you blessed of my Father, enter into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. You're going to stand one day before that throne, and Jesus is going to point you one way or the other. Which way is it going to be? If you haven't answered that question, then none of the other questions in your life are worth answering. Then there are the books. Now, you may say, well, what are these books? Well, they're the books that exist right here and now. First of all, there are books here in the Bible in which God expresses his will for you. You will be judged according to things written in those books. But there are other books as well. There are books in which are recorded, and they may not be literal books, but there is a, a, is a record, mark you. Whether it's a literal book or not is beside the point. There is a record. In that book is written everything that you are doing. In fact, you are really writing that book right now, aren't you? Every act, every thought, every word, it's recorded. And once it's done, you can't undo it. It's recorded. There's only one way to have a record erased from that book, and that's for it to be blotted out through the blood of Jesus Christ. Your sins can be blotted out, Acts 3.19, and that's the only way. Have you thought about what is written in these books, the books of the Bible? Have you thought about what's written in the record of your life? Is your name written in the book of life? Because you have given your allegiance to Jesus, 
and entered through faith and repentance and baptism into his life, you are going to stand before the throne. What's going to happen to you? Provided that you have taken this message of the book of Revelation to heart, you will enter into God's city and receive a crown of life. In Revelation 21, John saw the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel. Most of us love the cities that we live in and think they are beautiful. But how much more beautiful will be this beautiful, heavenly and eternal city of God, the New Jerusalem? In that city, there is a river of the water of life, and people are able to drink freely of that water of life. In our own uh, earth, we love to drink water when we're thirsty, but how much more wonderful it will be to drink of that eternal life in heaven. And in that heavenly city, there is laid up for you what is pictured in Revelation as a crown of life. Paul believed in that crown. He said, There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will present to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all those who have longed for his appearing. 2 Timothy 4.8 Jesus said, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Revelation 2.10 And as Peter described this, it is an inheritance reserved in heaven for you that can never fade away. Oh, let it be yours. At the end of the book of Revelation, there are two invitations, and I finish this lesson and this series with them. One of them is an invitation from Jesus Christ to you, and from his church and from the Holy Spirit to you. That invitation is simply, come. Whosoever will, let him come. Have you answered that invitation in the last chapter of the Bible? The other invitation in the same place is a response. It is the invitation of all of us who have believed in Jesus Christ and followed him faithfully. It's our invitation to him and it is, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you for watching. You are invited to visit simplybible.com.